Hello and welcome fellow film buffs. I'm Zach Drill and I'm joined by my co-host. Well, not really the f like old co-host, but a new one. I'm here joined by my good friend Yano. How's it going, man? Uh, it's going good. You know, I'm I'm gonna be replacing. You know, I'm, I'm the new replacement. It's gonna be <laughs> well, great uh, un until Hunter gets off a of vacation, which should be next week. But yeah, so um, uh, we are the box office losers. Well, I'm box office loser. Yano is just new to the set right now. Yeah. Um, each, each and every week, we deep dive into the movie sphere to watch and review any and all things that ever grace the silver screen or your TV screen. This week, we are talking about the film that started it all, Iron Man. All right. So, uh, to give you guys a rundown, we're going to do things a bit differently here. We're not going to go into full detail about the production notes. Uh, me and Yano know enough about this film to at least have about like a decent like 30-minute conversation about it. And then we'll talk about our review and all that other stuff. So, but before we dive into it, how was your week, Yano? How was your 4th of July? Uh, it was good. Got a uh, lot of fireworks, good food. Uh, not much else. Just nice time. How about you? I did nothing. I uh, drank, went to my uh, co-worker's house, well, my old, well, my old co-worker's house, uh, sat there for like two hours, and then went home. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So I can't really complain. Um, nothing else much has happened. I'm preparing for college, as you know. Gonna be getting the hell out of Long Island. But um, oh, you're leaving us. Well, yes, I have to. Um, I'm not gonna stay here forever. <laughs> but without further ado, let's just dive into this overview. Iron Man is a 2008 American superhero film based on the Marvel comic character of the same name. Uh, produced by Marvel Studios and uh, distributed by Paramount Pictures. It is the first film in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the MCU, directed by the GOAT himself of the MCU, John Favreau, uh, from a screenplay by the writing team of Mark uh, Fergus and Hawk uh, Ost Ospi. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. <laughs> and, um, and the art, um, Markham and Matt um, Holloway. So yeah, that, that is the rundown. Uh, oh, Yano, if you want to hop on to this script, that is the Google Drive that I sent you. Uh, Do you want me to send it to you again? I just need to open up a lot of things. I am so sorry. I, sh I, I thought I told you about this. You did. It's my fault. <laughs> uh, right, hang on, I just gotta, gotta get into it. That, that so. way, at least, like, you're, you're able to keep up with everything, and we can take breaks and discuss things okay uh aha there's the there it is i'm opening it up uh perfect i have this up awesome cool yeah. so the cast of this lovely movie consists of robert downey jr as the man himself tony stark uh terrence howard who was then re replaced by Don Cheadle as James Ro as James Rhodey Rhodes. It's gotta hurt so much. Yeah, it does. E especially the next time. Uh, <laughs> next no. time, baby. Not online for ten years. <laughs> uh, we got um, the the dude Jeff Bridges as Obadiah Stane. Uh, cannot pronounce that actor's name. I think that's Sean uh, Tobe Tube. Yeah, as as Ho e e Instant. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow as, well, Pepper Potts. Yep. Uh, Greg Clark as Phil Col as Phil Coulson. I thought it was Clark Gregg. Oh, Clark Gregg, my bad. <laughs> Phil Coulson as Phil Coulson. <laughs> okay, that. just, just, Phil Coulson, that's just... Phil Coulson's everyone now. Uh, Paul Bentley as Jarvis. The man, I'm actually surprised oh, right. he has kept his, his, his role for like 10, 11 years. Yeah, that's actually... That's interesting that I forgot he was, like, there for so long, since the beginning. Like, dang. Yeah. And then uh, Samuel L. Jackson, he appears at the end credits as Nick Fury. Mm. Very, like, a, a stacked cast. A uh, guy, someone like Paul Bentley is very, is a very intriguing thing that he stayed from the very beginning up until, well, now, up until right now. Well, mo at least, like, half of these actors have. I mean, Robert Downey Jr., Gwyneth Paltrow, pa Paltrow? Gwyneth yes. Paltrow, Samuel Jackson, and then Clark Gregg, sort of? Well, it's like, he returns it, sometimes. It's like, with Paul Bentley, though, he was just a voice. And then he mm -hmm. became an on-screen character in, in Age of Ultron. Yes. 
Yeah, you, you would think they really wouldn't care about a voice actor. They would just go, okay, no, no one's really going to care about the about the person. They, they would just shove someone else into there. I think that just knowing Kevin Feige uh, as the head of all of Marvel, I think he definitely cares about continuity heavily. And so mm. having the actor return is something that I think means a lot to him and definitely would mean a lot to the diehard fans. So I think for him, it's like, let's keep that going. So, Because yep. if you notice, after the first uh, phase of MCU, they never switched actors. Like, it was only... Uh, it was only Rhodey, and then it was Hulk, and that was it. They, as far as I'm aware, they never switched any of the other actors. All of them stayed the same. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, holy shit! Wait, yeah, yeah. It was only Phase One, and even then, it was only the first two Avengers movies, uh, well, Marvel movies, because uh, Hulk came out in 2008 in the summer, like I think like two months, three months after this. So it was only early on, and then after that. It's since 2010 onward that they stayed the same. Fuck. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. That's a very... That, shit. Mm-hmm. They, they like their continuity. So... Yeah. And to uh, be honest, it's really helpful. So... Now, hopping over to the uh, budget side of things and the box office numbers, this movie cost $140 million to make, and it made back its money and then some. Oh, yeah. With 585 Point point eight million dollars at the box office. That is the worldwide numbers. That's that's really good for especially for like a character that is just being introduced. Like that is definitely like insane. Because most movies would be like lucky to make back like two hundred mil, three hundred mil in uh if they're like new like that. Iron Man. I think the Marvel brand helped because. Spider-Man, people associated Marvel Spider-Man, so yeah. I think that might have helped a lot, but still, that's impressive. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as, I, as I said earlier in the recording, guys, we're not going to talk about, we're not going to do normal notes, we're going to do about just fun facts we know about this movie, fun facts we know about the direction that, that Iron Man was supposed to go in and where it went to. Like, the original casting for Iron Man was supposed to be um, Tom Cruise, well, wasn't it? Yes. That was like the so, 90s Yes, version. so uh, this movie, I think it was New Line that owned Iron Man. I can't remember Correct. which studio. It was New... It, okay, it's it was. the first paragraph. It's New Line. Okay. Uh, so, Iron Man was being in production. They were uh, hoping to have Tom Cruise be, the, be Iron Man, which would have been a good choice for the 90s. And it just never got picked up bunch of issues and it's just sort of like faded into the background along with most of the other marvel movies that were trying to be produced in the 90s the only marvel movie that was produced in the 90s or maybe late 80s i can't remember i think it was 89 uh or 91 that uh the first marvel movie came out which was howard the duck uh and mm. yep and that was the i think that was the only marvel movie uh, seriously, at least theatrically released like that until uh, Blade, and then X Men, yeah. and then Spider Man. Uh, but they really Marvel didn't have as much of a presence as DC at that time. So when they were trying to get themselves kicked up off the ground, they kept messing up a lot until they finally hit their stride in the early two thousands, when Marvel almost went bankrupt and sold the rest of their movie rights to basically every other studio, which then most of them lapsed over into back to Marvel which allowed this movie to be made. Mm -hmm. So. But, uh, so, uh, not, like, more interesting tidbits that we know, like, uh, you, you had mentioned this in, in passing during, like, conversations, that, um, Robert Downey Jr. got suspended from school from tearing up someone's Iron Man comic. Yep. Yeah, he teared up an Iron Man comic when he was young and got suspended for that, and ironically, he's now Iron Man. That's, like, it's hey, hey, that's just the TVA d d doing its job. Oh yeah, clearly TVA is uh like this messed with the sacred. This this needs to happen because sacred timeline. Yeah, uh, but it, that's just like so interesting to know that like someone like it's that pretty much was a butterfly effect. He he ripped it up and down the line he decided to be oh, let me let me be Iron Man. Oh yeah, because like because th this this movie helped his career. Well he, yeah. He, he was in a downward spiral. Yeah, his career was, like, almost gone. Uh, and then 
they took a risk on him and that really paid off like way too well like i don't think anyone was expecting it to pay off as well as it did oh yeah it did it did really well and the interesting thing is that robert downey jr had i think he did help a little bit with the uh writing a bit though most of the actors did because when they were pro- when they were uh producing the movie three years never had a script uh fully like they had an idea of a script they had them like the pinpoints they wanted to make but they didn't have anything fully written down so essentially it was like when people would arrive on set they'd be like so this is what you need to touch on this is the idea of the scene this and that improv so most of iron man is completely improvised aside from maybe a few scenes most of it is improvised by the actors who just understood their characters well yeah uh so which is why the dialogue in in the movie feels very natural uh it just it works extremely well and that's because everyone just knows their characters and is just sort of reacting on the spot so it's quite amazing that that happened because normally a movie like if it's like has almost no script or no concrete like script in during its production usually fails oh yeah that that is 100 percent the truth um I, I, I'm, I'm picking some things from the notes that we have. Apparently, so Nicolas Cage wanted to portray Tony Stark. <laughs> Nicolas Cage wanted to portray so many different characters. He wanted to be he wanted to be Superman. He wanted to be Iron Man. He wanted, he wants to get everywhere. Essentially. Well, like I, I'm trying to picture a, a Nicolas Cage, and I, I could see that working, but not as well as RDJ. Yeah, now Robert Downey Jr. fits it too well, and I think at this point Nicolas Cage is too iconic with uh, Ghost Rider. That's gonna be hard to see him as other superheroes. Well, well, I, well th- this was like pre Ghost Rider. This was in in ninety seven of January, so he he thought about expressing uh, the role. That's true. I'm just saying also, nowadays though. That also like Quentin Tarantino wanted to direct it. That's really what? That's mind boggling. Uh, yeah, that is the. I'm trying to see the line. It's underneath the Modoc stuff that it says that uh, in October, Quentin Tarantino was approached to write and direct the film. Fox sold the rights to New Line Cinemas following December, uh, reasoning that although uh, the uh, Vintar Lee, uh, the Vintar and Lee script was strong, the studio had too many Marvel superheroes in development, and we can't make them all. Mm. Huh. It's still like, oh. I, I'm now. I, I want to see uh, a Quentin Tarantino Iron Man. That would be very interesting. Because uh, Quentin Tarantino has a lot of interesting movies that have definitely a unique vision to them. So adding that to something like Iron Man would have been, huh? Like very I, I, interesting. I, I do think like the cave stuff and then the uh, town that was getting taken hostage would have been a lot more bloodier. Oh yeah, and a bit more gorier, in that in that sense. Yeah, probably. It's like, but like I, I think Quentin Tarantino would have had weight. I think he would have thrown too much humor into the movie. I mean, Marvel already does that. Well, like, but <laughs> if like this was so, this was '90s. So I think this was post, like, so post Reservoir Dogs. I think just getting into Pulp Fiction. Okay. So, so Tarantino had a few things under his belt, but I, but I think he would have done a little bit too much in this movie. That kind of would have made it fall flat. Maybe I haven't seen almost. I've only seen like a few Quentin Tarantino movies. Uh, I saw Inglorious Bastards. That Tarantino, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. I so I saw a bit of that. Uh, but other than that, I haven't seen many of his other films. But I have an idea of what his style is. I think that maybe I think it key I think he could have pulled it off in the 90s. From what I see in his style, I think he could have pulled it off. It just would have been very different uh and uh yeah, it just would have been very different than I think what most people would be used to because you have to keep in mind that in that time, the only, the superhero movies that we had were the Christopher Reeve Superman and uh the Tim Burton Batman. Uh uh we also had the Fantastic Four ones. Like those directed DVDs. Oh, oh right, I forgot about those. Yeah. Oh gosh, we yeah. We had those. We, we we had those Marvel movies. We, we oh, had. Oh, there was that Captain America one too. Oh. And the Spider Man. Oh god, this is this is non flashbacks. I didn't need. <laughs> I... Welcome to the shit, brother. 
Yep. Oh, gosh. Yeah. The, the ones that were in the public consciousness was Superman and Batman. Correct. Maybe Howard the Duck to the one-off person that's a diehard fan of George Lucas. But that's besides the point. Um, Just not many... Like, those were the superhero movies in mind. And Quentin Tarantino, I think, would have been... I think he would have been much darker if he were to do Iron Man in that time. And I think that would have mm. been... Uh, that would have been very interesting. And depending on how that could have done, would have been competition for Batman. And that could have altered a lot. True. Like Now, with Quentin Tarantino directing, say, in Iron Man, who would you cast as uh, as Tony Stark at that time? <sighs> I, so still, it, it, I still think it, Tom Cruise is the best. I, I like Tom Cruise... Um, but I, I'm trying to think of a more like dark and brooding, a, a brooding actor at the time. You, you could have threw Val Kilmer in before he became Batman. That is true. Val Kilmer probably could have done that. Or you could have also th- threw in George Clooney. Yeah, just thinking on the Batman actors. Yeah, I, I, George Clooney probably could have done well. George Clooney himself, I think, could be a great superhero. You just need to give that, uh, give him the right script, which he never got the right script. Uh, but yeah, he, he probably could have done it. Yeah. It's like it, it, it's those key things you always have to like really think about because I, I think Val Kilmer would have been insanely interesting. Definitely interesting, yeah. And then like Clooney because he he has like Clooney could be a good Tony Stark, but probably not the best Iron Man. Yeah, I think I, I think that's the thing with George Clooney is that, uh, like you look at him in Batman and Robin and. For as much as you say about Batman and Robin, because it's not a great movie, he did do Bruce Wayne really well. To me, he is, like, a very good Bruce Wayne. Mm -hmm. It's just he's... Batman is a little jarring for him. Very jarring. Oh, it Um, is. So, I feel like he can pull off that billionaire, like, part of, like, a superhero really well, but then the superhero part might fall a little flat, kind of like Tobey Maguire as Spider-Man. You know, it's the similar thing. Yeah. Uh, not try, I, I just remember, like, wasn't, like, like the 90s version of Spider-Man supposed to be um, DiCaprio? Yes. Cause I remember. Yep. Because I, I remember seeing all those, like, I remember I saw, like, someone did a, an edit of what the 90s, um, uh, like, Avengers w- w- would have been. Mm-hmm. And it's so interesting to see that yeah james cameron was also supposed to write and direct uh so it was uh, a james cameron spider-man movie featuring uh everyone too it, it, it would have featured the x-men too because this was before fox and marvel and disney were all at each other's throats yeah uh because i think they were more under one studio funny enough actually iron man was supposed to tie into uh spider-man and x-men because what happened was uh they the studio marvel studios tried to go to sony and go to fox because of the clout kevin feige had because he worked at both for the superhero stuff Mm -hmm. to be like hey let's get these versions of these characters in our universe and just build like that the only one that ever said anything was universal they were the ones that accepted uh but the other two just kind of laughed in their face uh, and was just like, nah, we're, we're making money. We're making bank. We're not going to do that. Uh, which is upsetting because there was an end credit scene that they filmed that you could see in the deleted scenes mentioning mutants and radioactive spider bites and stuff like that. Uh, it's an alternate yeah, version. Yeah. So it's, that would have been interesting if that changed, if like they were in the MCU. Cause like, oh gosh, they could have been in Avengers and that would have been right, weird. Cause, um, uh, I remember, like, there was a fan edit of an Avengers trailer that was on YouTube. And the only three people that you saw were um, Edward Norton's Hulk, mm-hmm. Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man, um, uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man, and um, Hugh Jackman's Wolverine. W- Wolverine. Yeah. Like, that just, like, it's... Man, like, it's, like, I'm trying to think of the world that we would be in if the Fox stuff never happened and where like the avengers would be now (laughs) it would certainly be very different i think personally i would uh i would have loved to see my if this if this happened like my perfect timeline would have been that 
Fox said yes for the uh, X-Men stuff. Sony would say no to Spider-Man until it came to Amazing Spider-Man. Because Amazing Spider-Man was supposed to be uh, at one yes. point. So, the, and then, because I, I personally like Andrew Garfield the best. Controversy, I know. Uh, but I love Andrew Garfield the best as Spider-Man. So, I would have loved it if that happened. And then, like, Spider-Man would have appeared in, like, Avengers already built up from the first uh, Spider-Man movie. And then, like, you just have, like, these characters exist in this universe. I think that would have been awesome, but unfortunately, companies are greedy and don't like to share. And Yeah, and people want to create a control on their own characters, and then Sony gets hacked, and then shit hits the fan. Yeah. I mean, hey, Spider-Man is now in the MCU. Yeah. Uh, and played by a good actor. Tom Holland's good as Spider-Man. Uh, and X-Men are currently in production. Blade is... Fantastic Four, we're getting a lot of stuff in the MCU now. Oh, I... So, uh, this is completely off-topic. That just reminded me of something of, of the X-Men. Uh, I saw on... We've kind of been tic- mostly off-topic. It, it's been off-topic, but... but we're still but, but we're still keeping within superheroes. We're still talking about the movies in some regards. Yeah. I, I This is what I... I, I like doing the, the, note-based, the note-based stuff, but also I like branching off into side conversations. So I saw uh, a TikTok and chorus as always, guys. It will be in the. It will be on for the uh, video listeners now. Audio listeners, you hear the audio. So I forgot what it was. I think it was um like w- Wolverine and Cable doing something, and uh uh so w- 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 so Logan gets uh Professor Xavier goes and um uh. Xavier goes, "Where are you taking me?" He goes to meet your to meet your worst enemy. Stairs and pushes him down a flight of stairs. Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, oh man. I mean, out of all things, that would be his worst enemy. Yeah. Uh, every uh, you want to know what Magneto should do? He should just build a lair with stairs and be like, "You can't get me, Charles." Ha ha. Until until Xavier just decides to do some levitation type shit, and just Chris Angel his way up the stairs. Ah, oh, shit, he's honed his powers. <laughs> but, like, um, now, with Iron Man, though, like, getting back to the, the, the topic of this podcast, that this movie also came out around the height of, like, superhero movies. You had, like, Batman, I think, well, like, Dark Knight came out around this time, right? Dark, Na- Dark Knight came out the same year within, I think, like, a few months. Like, th- this was, like, a... I, 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 I will always attribute Dark Knight to the boom in superhero movies that got a lot of attention i think that spider-man certainly did that a lot though because spider-man uh was big uh back in 2002 and 2004 uh and i think that did a lot uh but dark knight certainly pushed it further especially also showing that uh dark superhero movies can actually work and not be silly yeah so because a lot of the ones that tried to be darker were very silly so uh it's good that it showed that um, it is but yeah 2008 was good for superhero movies uh at the very least if you consider iron man and the dark knight there uh hulk is debatable uh, it, there's good things about it there's bad things about it it's it's a messy movie it, me being a fan uh I, are we talking about incredible hulk or like the first incredible hulk okay so me being that a fan of like uh, uh, of edward norton because of Fight Club, I would have loved to seen him continue on as Hulk, but we all know what happened. Uh, Edward Norton wanted full creative control on how he wanted the Hulk to go. That's yep. not how you do things, buddy. Well, the thing, Edward Norton was notorious for uh, wanting to be more heavily involved with the production. He wanted Hulk to be... He actually made changes to Incredible Hulk uh, during its production, and he mm. wanted to push the next Hulk movie to be more darker to be like dark knight almost in how dark I kind of I, I I wouldn't mind that. Yeah, I know that would have been kind of interesting. Uh I think he would have also at that point pushed the um monster aspect more cuz Hulk at, at at his core is kind of a monster movie. That's the whole identity of it. It's a Jekyll so, and Hyde type situation. Yeah. And like it's you know, it, it that's kind of interesting, and I I wish they did more with that, because 
I'm f like, it would have been cool to see more monster movie stuff in the MCU, but unfortunately, Universal had publishing rights, and Disney it's, was like, no. It's also like, don't get me wrong, like, Mark Ruffalo is a good Hulk, but I think Edward Norton could, like, he, he would have did a bit better. Yeah, I'm, uh, I honestly, I'm more preferential to Edward Norton as well. It's, uh, Mark Ruffalo is fantastic in all regards, but something about Edward Norton's performance is just really nice and really, like, interesting. He, he's someone who kind of deserves a second chance at it. Yeah, he does. And hopefully, maybe with this multiverse of madness, maybe there's something. Maybe oh, there's yeah. nothing. We don't know. I, I hope well, so. I, I, I just saw another possible casting for Tony Stark, Sam Rockwell. Huh. That's... I don't think that would have worked too well, personally. Yeah, yeah. I, I I agree with that, but also that's another interesting thing. Yeah. Shit. I mean, they have a lot of, uh, they just, they were looking for actors that would have been popular at the time, so. Oh, uh, that's so interesting. Um, so, but, uh, but, but then, but then Rockwell did come in to play Justin Hammer in Iron Man 2, so. I, yeah, he did. Uh, he does much better at that role. And then, uh, let's just briefly talk about, I guess, uh, the Terrence Howard situation. I'll, I'll read the brief snippet from here. Um, additional casting did occur. Over the next few months, Terrence How Howard was announced to play the role of Stark's best friend, uh, Rhodey, or just Rhodes, or James Rhodes, whatever you want to call him, in October of 2006. Gwyneth Paltrow was then casted as the love interest as Pepper Potts. In January of, of 2007, Jeff Bridges was then cast. Uh, Don Cheadle had also been approached to play the role of Rhodes, and who eventually was replaced by Howard's. But then, of course, we all know the switcheroo that happened, all because um, Terrence How Howard did want more money and also wanted to be treated a bit better in in regards of his character. But I, I, it's it's another situation like I, I, I can't see Iron Man without Don Cheadle now. I I, I kind of can't see the MCU without it. Yeah, I I like. Uh, Terrence Howard's performance, but Don Cheadle is just better. It, he is like I, I, I it's like you, you just can't see a world without certain people casting. Like I can't see Gwyneth Paltrow not being Pepper Potts. Yeah, there's they're iconic now and like staples of the MCU. And if you, yeah, you know, it's hard to imagine them without that. Yeah, it's like I, I, I can't see John Favreau not being happy. That's yeah, something yeah. I, 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 I cannot I cannot unsee that. It's amazing that he went from director of movies to then an actor in the universe he started. Like, that's kind of interesting to think about. Yeah. So. Uh, then, um, of course, we, we do get a little nod to the, to the previous, to, to the next coming movies. We had Captain America Shield and Iron Man 2, which is, we'll get to Iron Man 2 when we uh, reach that part of the reviews and everything. Oh, we'll get to uh, that. Yeah, like ho hopefully we, we do keep you on as a mainstay for the MCU movies. I if anything, though, I'll, I'll see if my friend would would want to skip the MCU and just be me and you. It's all up to him. Okay. But, uh, yeah, it all depends on how this one goes and how everyone sees everything. All right. Um, uh, not, I'm trying to avoid talking about the notes too much. Maybe we uh, should dive into the movie a bit because we didn't really dive into the movie all that much. Yeah. So, so uh, the plot. Uh, I'll read the. I'll read the first paragraph. We'll take breaks in between, and stuff like that. Uh, so uh, Tony Stark, who has inherited the, the defense contract of Stark Industries uh, from his later fa father, Howard Stark, is a war-torn Afghanistan in a war-torn Afghanistan with his friends on the military uh, liaison, Lieutenant uh, uh, Colonel James Rhodes, to demonstrate the new Jericho missile. After the demonstration. The convoy is ambushed, and Stark is critically wounded by a missile used by the attackers. Uh, one of his own company, he is captured by the he is captured and imprisoned in a cave by the terrorist group known as the Ten Rings of uh, Yinsen. A fellow captive doctor implants an electromagnetic into Stark's chest to keep the shrapnel shard uh, that wounded him from reaching his heart and killing him. Ten Rings leader uh, 
Raza offers Stark freedom in exchange for building a Jericho missile for the group. Um, but he and Jensen know that Raza will not keep his word. So yeah, like that's like that's pretty much just like the first like good half hour of this movie. Yeah, the plot of Iron Man is radically darker than the rest of the MCU. Because it is. like you look at the rest of the MCU and it's like space battle or like Hydra and the giant purple man, and here it's just terrorists. It's yeah, terrorists it's, and capitalists trying I, to get money. I do money. think, though, I, I, I can see, like, I also, if you look at the time we were in, in, in America as a whole, yeah, I, I think we, we, we kind of, like, this this showed us what, um, kind of, like, what the military kind of was doing that was kind of shitty, and we kind of, and this kind of made some people maybe, like, against war more. Well, Cause... there's always been a history of that, but it probably, yeah, that probably didn't help. Because, uh, like, it's... Uh... But Iron Man definitely reflects our, like, what 2008 was holding in terms of its political conflict. But it's just, it's just insane to think that it's being, that something like that is being, like, as, like, a, as essential a to the plot in a Marvel movie, which nowadays does nothing related to that anymore. Yeah, the, 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 this is like, the, the, this was the start of the MCU, and the whole entire like, well, besides the Ten Rings being brought up in Iron Man, uh, three, and then Shang Chi, and and, and and then yeah, Shang Chi, that, that that's the only time we, we hear the Ten Rings, and then like terrorist stuff, because yeah. it was because the terrorist stuff w- w- was a w- was a light focused in Iron Man three. Mm-hmm. And then now with the ten with uh with Shang Chi coming out, it's going to be a heavy focus. I don't think that it's going to be as much of a heavy focus on the terrorism aspect as Iron Man one did, or how Iron Man three lightly touched on it. It's it's probably just going to be more fictitious, I guess is the word you'd say, more mm-hmm. in fiction than what uh, this movie was trying to do with reality. Uh, following up with the plot, um, Stark and Yinsen do uh do a secretly build a powerful just suit just an overall suit to overpower uh the ten rings um uh it they th- once the suit is later built the uh the ten rings uh soldiers try, try to break in they ultimately die because of a bomb placed on the door the the supposed leader of ten, uh, ten rings raza uh tries to stop tony that does not work yinsen ends up dying because he sacrificed himself for Tony to get out, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, we uh, uh, we, we now uh, see uh, to, uh, Iron Man at his finest, just doing some war crimes, flame throwing a bunch of terrorists. I mean, he's trying to break out and not die, I know, so but it's ex- it's excusable. I know, but he was point blank, Setting point blank. Fire. Not not really a good thing. He was point blank shooting at them. He needed to free himself. Yes. Then he uh, he later uh, jet rockets out. Uh, he gets picked up by Rhodes, sent sent home to get some nice BK burgers. Oh yeah, all American cheeseburger from Burger King. That oh, was yeah. that was a good sponsorship on Burger King's part. Very smart, very smart sponsorship. This was when like uh, the Burger King toys were good. This they were like mm. uh, Burger King had the Spider-Man toys, and everything else. Now McDonald's has all the good toys, and everyone's left with shit. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Uh, what I love about um, something a detail that I like about uh, in this movie is that Yensid mentions that he met Stark years ago at a conference, but that he was too drunk to remember, which we see in Iron Man 3 in the beginning. Yep. Which is just, that's a nice little attention to detail that, like, it's easy to miss if you haven't seen Iron Man 3, but after you've seen it, it's just a nice detail. Uh, but the entire opening sequence up to when he breaks out and everything uh, is just awesome in Stark's character development of how he's just this uh, very much egotistical uh, billionaire that lived in comfortability and doesn't care much about the lives of innocents to them being one of the people victimized by his weapons and 
like in such a traumatic event that it completely reorients what his priorities are he's still himself he's still trying to well he's still part of he's still like himself from before a little bit like his personality is still there but he's trying to be better and you see that start here and then progress through the next movies but it's done so incredibly well it here mm -hmm. it's like um then uh following up the following up with the plot uh stark then does a press conference saying that stark industries will stop all means of production on on weapons which is a very a very good thing to do uh it's very interesting that that ultimately does lead to him getting kicked out of his company out of his father's company should we say unfortunately i just like it's very weird that how like y you're the ceo but yet people below you can vote you out of a, of a company yeah it's the board of directors if they they have that power if they feel you're not doing what's in the company's best interests unfortunately um it is later to find out that Tark Industries uh uh that that that's, that, that the reporter for Vanity Fair uh Christine Everhart I think that's the actress right yeah that's the is that the actress who played her uh I don't oh, think no 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 never yeah, mind no. It, it, it's a character in the MCU okay so yeah. so Christine Everhart informed Stark that his weapons were sold and delivered to the Ten Rings and they start the attack on Jensen's home village. This is where, like, th this is where kind of, like, the best scene kind of kicks in. This was where, like, the trailer scene was with the, uh, shooting the rock at the tank and walking away. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, like, like the dog fight in the, in the sky with, with, with the, with the jets. Yeah, that scene was plastered everywhere. And I will say it was also it was it was uh, remade well in the video games. I will say that from oh, what I've seen. Right, there was the Sega games uh, that they went from Iron Man all the way up until Captain America, and they never made an Avengers game and stopped. Well, well, we all know how the recent Avengers game went. Oh uh, yeah, uh, that do, do I do I own it? Yeah. Do I have I touched it in a while? Nope. I, I don't own it. I do not want to touch that game. I The only reason why I have it was the GameStop near my old house was closing down. They were having a sale. They had the collector's edition for like 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. And can't turn down a collector's edition for 50 bucks. Yeah. I mean, it's not a bad deal. So. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So, so, the dogfight happens in the sky. This is when Rhodey finds out that Stark is the one in the in the suit that's in the sky. Which I will say, this was still an amazing scene and a, and a very funny uh, bantering back and forth between them. Mm -hmm. uh, following up, we uh, we do get introduced to uh, Phil Coulson of Shield, and pretty much they're like, "Yeah, we need to debrief uh, Tony Stark now." That doesn't happen at all. They try to. Uh, Tony Stark just blatantly comes out. Uh, it will we'll get to that he play, he, but he does just mention some stuff um uh it, we do find out that obadiah stain is the person behind um tony stark's kidnapping and all that other stuff can you imagine uh, how like traumatizing that is like it is that is like essentially your uncle because he was like best friends with your father and he tried to kill you he tried ordering a hit on you by terrorists because he wanted you not even because you were doing anything bad with the company he just wanted you out he's like i want the power like <laughs> that is so messed up so can we also mention how we found out about this so it was pepper pot she went to stark's offices um she went to the ceo's office which was now obadiah stains and obadiah stain being the dumbass he is has the footage has the ransom footage and it's for somehow in 2008 2008 um, you're able to type in translate into a video and it does it beautifully. <laughs> I'm wondering if he did that himself. Like, I, he might have had a translation bot, like, built into his computer because it's Stark. He, Stark has a lot of I know, but like, but I know, but, but, but it sounds like a person saying and not a robot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it, it's not even, like, text or anything. Yeah, it's... Ugh. It's... it's th 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 That's the only thing that kind of got me mad because even when we saw this... Um, cause we, we were showing our friend the, the MCU stuff for the first time. Hasn't seen a like, single one. I was like, that's not how this works. You can't just go, 
translate, and boom, it's perfect, clear, you can barely, well-spoken English. You can barely do that now. Yeah. Like, it's, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't. Oh, gosh. Um, but, so, uh, we, we do find out that Obadiah Stain is building his own suit uh, to just kill Tony with and take over the world. That's the best what I can get out of it. He just wants money in the company. It's a stereotypical, like, rich person just wants money. So, the movie is not necessarily focused on having a... Like, it has a main antagonist, but it serves to push the main character. You're really watching the movie for Iron Man and Tony Stark and what his journey is and how investing of a character he is. You're also with Pepper Potts. You're invested in her uh, and how the universe is being built. You don't really watch it for the villain. Yeah, because o- o- Obadiah Stane wasn't really the best villain. Neither is the one in Iron Man 2. Iron Man 3, kind of. Which, Iron Man 3 just chucks a lot of shit at the wall, to be honest. They they tried to do something, but it just didn't work as well as they were hoping for. Yeah. It worked better than Iron Man 2. Iron Man 2 is pretty messy, but... It, but uh, both of those are a far cry from Iron Man 1. Uh, to wrap up the plot, so um, Obadiah Stane builds his own suit. Uh, Iron Man, Tony Stark, goes to uh, pretty much just fight him. Uh, Iron Man successfully takes down Obadiah Stane, all because someone forgot about the defreezing problem. That's yeah. the one thing that they, that he forgot to work on. Uh, the The battle ends with Pepper Potts uh, pretty much just hitting the um, the arc reactor. The arc re- reactor self destruct, and it it kills Obadiah Stane pretty much instantly. Somehow does not kill Tony Stark. Yeah, that that is a little weird considering Tony Stark was closer. But I guess it was more focused on Obadiah Stane's t- technology, his his like suit. Maybe I, it's a little weird. And then um, so after all that, a press conference happens. Uh, Phil Coulson was like, hey, so you say this. You were not there. Uh, Tony Stark pretty much says, fuck that noise. G- hits the stage, goes, I'm Iron Man, and credits roll. With uh, Iron Man being played by... Uh, Black Sabbath. Black Sabbath, okay. I almost said Iron Maiden, but I'm like, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the, Now, the post credit scene, uh, this was when uh, Marvel would make you wait. Oh, yeah. For this post credit scene. This wasn't like the first post credit scene. You see it and then you leave. No, they made you wait. Mm-hmm. I like to like I like to be this known. The first time I saw this movie was on a bootleg DVD. And it did not have the end credit scene. Oh gosh, that sucks. So there's that. So so the post credit scene it sets up for the Avengers uh, Shield director Nick Fury. Uh, visit Stark's home, telling him that Iron Man is not the only superhero in this world, explaining he wants to discuss the Avengers initiative. Yeah. Which is like just so it, it's always so interesting now, like even going back and watching, Iron Man is the is the catalyst and the Avengers initiative that made everyone just like, whoa, what's going on? Yep, and then when you watch it, it at the time, you would watch Hulk, like, soon after and see the it end credit scene of Iron Man going to Tim Roth's character. Uh, what's his name again? It's uh, Thunderbolt Ross. Yeah. Uh, no, wait, no, it's not Tim Roth. That's not his he name. Was Tim, meeting, Roth, uh, Tim Roth is Abomination. I'm sorry. I, I he think. was meeting Edward Norton in a, in a bar. No, he wasn't meeting Hulk. He was meeting the uh, general, Thunderbolt Ross. Uh, Iron Man okay. met Thunderbolt Ross in a bar and was like, yeah, we're building a team. Uh, so, Hmm. and it was like, oh, so they are connected and something is happening. And as you watch further, you know, in the other movies, it builds up to Avengers. So uh, imagine waiting that long now to see all that come together. Cause like we, we do it all the time with Marvel, but like for it to be the start, like that must've been insane. Yeah. So, cause like I personally, the first Marvel movie I watched was Avengers. That was the first one. I didn't see any of the others. I only saw clips of the others, but never one fully. Uh, and then I never really saw many of the other ones except Guardians and Guardians 2. I saw Age of Ultron and Ant-Man and then Civil War, and I was pretty consistent after that. 
Uh, but it took a while before I watched all the Marvel movies. Uh, so I, when I went into Avengers, I didn't have all that knowledge in the background of all the movies and waiting for that long. I was 12 years old, so it's like, it was just kind of like, oh, hey, this is cool. I think for me, so. I didn't see any of them in theaters. I saw a lot of them on bootleg. I saw, I think the mm-hmm. first one I saw in theaters was Avengers. Okay. And like, I, I didn't see Captain America in theaters I didn't see Winter Soldier. I saw Civil War. I seen pretty much anything after, um, I think Winter Soldier. I saw. Okay. Like I, I saw Civil War, Age of Ultron, uh, everything else in between. Okay. I I'm pretty much the same though. I mi- like from uh, Age of Ultron onward, except I missed, uh. I missed Homecoming, and I missed Ragnarok. Because mm. I, at the time, I just wasn't a huge fan of Thor. And also, I just did not like uh, Tom Holland as Spider-Man at the time either. That's uh, fair. I I was a little salty about Andrew Garfield being kicked out like that. And I'm like, mm, no, nah, so... Now, um, hopping over to the reviews, because we don't have any mid-movie notes, because we pretty much bullshitted enough through this podcast that we're at 46 minutes. So oh, that's wow. That's good. Um, <laughs> so, on the review aggregator website, Rotten Tomatoes reported a 94% approval rating from the average critics. Yep. I'm pretty sure it has... Let me double-check the critic ratings. Well, not the critics, the audience ratings. I'm pretty sure that's the highest rated uh, Marvel movie so far. And it has a 91 from uh, fans. Okay. I don't think that's th- that can't be the highest rated one. I think Hold it on. is. I-, I think Iron Man 1 is the highest rated. Hold on. <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> I don't believe that for a goddamn... Nope. Uh, I'll try MCU, you're saying. Yeah. Because I, I saw Spider Verse, I was like, oh well, that it's at that. Well, Spider Verse is just the one of the best Marvel movies. Period. There's uh, no debating that. But out of the MCU, I think it's the highest. I think Endgame might have it be no Endgame. No, uh, uh, um, Endgame is the same with it. Endgame's the same. Okay. Yeah. Really? Huh. Yeah, I'm not gonna go through the entire MCU. I just see that, um, that Endgame is also at 94. Okay. Uh, the critical census does read, um, powered by Robert Downey Jr.'s vibrant charm, Iron Man turbocharges the superhero genre with a uh, deft intelligence and uh, intellectual sense of humor. Uh, yes. Uh, now, uh, if you're looking at my rating, Yano, did you give it higher than me, or are you giving it lower than me? So you gave it an 8, right? Out of 10? Yes. So I would give it a 9 out of 10. Okay, so read the good review first. That is from uh, Craig uh, Alther of Orange County Registry. Read the good one? I thought you just read yeah. that. Well, no. Well, no. I, I, I read the I, I read the re, I read the aggregator one. Just read oh. the, the good one from, from Craig Outer. Okay, led by Downey's career-resurrecting performance as billionaire weapons peddler Tony Stark, it provides just as indispensable to the movie's giddy escapist appeal as the seamless CGI effects and eye-popping pyrotechnics. A lot of it was done I, uh, with, with like, spe- like with uh, actual effects. So yeah. With, um, yeah. Practical, practical effects, and that's something to be commended. Like that, that was awesome for the time. And, like, now, it, a lot of it is just CGI now, but for the time, like, that was, it was cool to see a lot of that feeling real and looking real. Yeah, once, once, our, our, once Robert Downey Jr. realized he can be in a CGI suit, he was like, fucking do that, please. I don't want to be wearing this for, like, 18 hours in a, a day. Can't say I blame him. <laughs> but now, re- reading the bad review from Parari Miller of Newsblaze. <clears throat> and you know, guys, it was very hard to find a bad review that didn't just criticize Robert Downey Jr. But that's pretty much all of them. Sporting <laughs> a novel brand of swinger superhero, Iron Man's got a goofy Robert Downey Jr. wisecracking his way through unlikely feats in fantasy politics, with all the demonstrate all the demonstrations of someone who just wandered in from a corner bar. Jeez. Not- 
Yeah, when I say I find the bad reviews, I find the harshest reviews possible. Like, this just feels more like a personal attack on Robert Downey Jr. than it oh. does an actual criticism of the movie. Like, There's one good sign. I'm gearing up for um for the podcast to, to watch, say, a uh, Clint Eastwood movie. There is, like, one guy who has not given a single good review of a Clint Eastwood movie. Oh, jeez. He, like, he just has a personal vendetta against that man. Oh, boy, that must be fun. So I cannot wait to get to those. Um, so and now hopping into our reviews, I'll read mine first. Uh, I'm, uh, as Yana said, I'm giving this eight Burger King product placements out of ten. This movie is what started it all, and it was a damn good start. This being the movie that saved Robert Downey Jr.'s career makes it just as special as, as it is amazing. Um, I, I, could, I couldn't think of a better way for this movie to be done. It's It, it does a lot for... Marvel, because it made Marvel bit. It made Marvel a household name. Yeah. If you if you don't count Spider Man, the X Men, and like Fantastic Four before this, this made Marvel a household name for a lot of people. Mm hmm. Yeah, it definitely skyrocketed Marvel to a bigger popularity. Uh, and with its subsequent movies being more interconnected, it stopped being one hero and being and now it's multiple heroes under Marvel. Like you, people now know Marvel as Iron Man, Captain America, that entire universe instead of the individual characters. Mm -hmm. So now, Yano, on this channel, we 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 like to do the reviews, and we always put a funny little nod to it. So, what are you giving this out of ten? I'm giving it. Uh, let's see here. I'm giving it nine reactor cores out of ten. Uh, right. I think that other than like two small things that just don't like that just could have been done a little better like the translation thing stuff like that this movie is fantastic everything about it uh with its plot its dialogue its characters uh just succeeds in every way and making you believe them and making you like them even when they are complete douches or assholes you like them you uh engage with them and they're just great performances the effects are really good for the time like for 2008 like it's just really good even the cgi while looking a little dated still holds up pretty well even now and it manages to set up a universe without uh the without it um neglecting any of the important stuff that makes this movie good like its story and everything it sets it up very subtly and i think that that is fantastic it is in my opinion the second best mcu movie because of that i would say like since um like well, both me and you pretty much own like the 4ks of this right uh i do not own the 4ks but i do own i only own this movie in a collector's edition uh for okay. the phase one cinematic universe i will say since i since i i, I do the stupid thing I, I buy the 4k versions of whatever movie i can and with this being in 4K, I really don't notice the CGI stuttering at all. Yeah, no, it still looks really good. The one like, you, you, you have to really pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I think the... I don't know if, this ju if it's the 4K one or it's just the Disney Plus version. They removed the film grain. Uh, 4K doesn't have film grain. It's like clear and shit like that. It's kind of disappointing. I like the film grain. I think it adds something to like the look. Yeah, I do agree. But since we are uh, gearing up on that 53-minute mark, well, 54-minute mark, we're going to round it out. Uh, thank you guys for listening. You can follow us on uh, on, tw on Instagram at Box Office Losers and on Twitter at Box Office Loser for up-to-date news, posts, or whenever we feel like posting. We haven't posted in, like, two months. Sue us. Um, don't forget to leave a review. It subscribe to the strong. channel. Yeah. And share with, share with your friends. Um Yano, do you have anything of social media wise you want to pimp out? Any anything else? Um, I don't really have a public social media set up. Uh, I might okay. if, if this if, if I do become a bit more part of this, I will set up a public thing. But awesome. for now, I have really nothing. Uh, I'm just here. Hi. Well, <laughs> so uh, then you can find well then you can find me at Dark Shadows Ache literally everywhere. You know I say everywhere. If if, uh, if I created everywhere. a mice if I created a MySpace, I, I probably it's under Dark Shadows Eight. I don't know. 
Um, you can also catch me every Thursday. So happy to say that again. Every Thursday on the Sports Hit List for the AEW Injection. That is a um, AEW post show that I host with my friends on the Sports Hit List. And um, you can catch me whenever it gets uploaded. The What Ifs of Pro Wrestling. Also on the Sports Hit List. But that is all, guys. We do appreciate you for listening, and we'll catch you all in the next episode. Thank you again, Yano, for coming out. No problem. Hopefully, Always happy to come. Hopefully you're Don't a mainstay. Don't take that out of context. <laughs> hopefully you can be a mainstay, and Box Office Loser will be a network that you can post your stuff on. All right. I hope so. That would be actually really nice. All right, guys. We'll see you all next time. Peace.